Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 10th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of the discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the growing calls for scrutiny of the Permanent Fund Board. Second, we explain how, rather than rationally discuss the actual facts about the Cook Inlet, the ADN editorial page, or as we sometimes call it, the Binkley Family blog, seems to be hyperventilating. And third, we ask, given the increasing focus on the Cook Inlet, why haven't we seen the Utilities Phase 2 report nor heard from the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, which has authority over the utilities, on these issues. And now, let's join Michael. All right, Brad. Well, let's let's get into this and uh, see what what we got going on. Let's uh, let's get get cracking. First and foremost, the Permanent Fund Board, back in the news, there's still more calls for, for... uh, in investigations and insight and everything else, let's get started. Well, Michael, uh, uh, we don't need to recount all of the chaos that the Permanent Fund Board has been going through. Everything from, you know, focusing a, a portion of its assets on investments in state, which hasn't turned out to be a great thing, to you know the the most recent, which is essentially giving the uh, legislature the finger by saying, "I know you you don't want us to keep the." Uh, we know you don't want us to keep the Anchorage office going. We know you only you line item appropriated only a hundred dollars, but guess what? We're going to keep it going. We're going to shove money around, says Adam Crum, in order to keep it going. So you know, we, we the 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 chaos has been has been fairly clear. The response though is is beginning to come in. The votes are beginning to come in. Um, a few weeks ago, the beginning of May. The ADN had an editorial said permanent funds should divest from a bad investment bet. That was more focused on Ellie Rubenstein than than anything else. But but it's uh, it, it it really should speak to the entire board as being a bad investment bet, a bad structure to to govern the state. We had the FT article, the Financial Times article uh, uh, that came after that that talked about uh, again the Ellie Rubenstein. Uh, uh, situation, um, and 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 I think really hit the nail on the head. Hit the nail on on the head of what the problem is when it talked about a six person financial layman board. We don't have a professional board. We've got a board made up of financial, mostly a financial layman, uh, and I think that's I think that's a big part of the problem. And as we've talked on the show, I think I think a restructuring. But this last week saw a couple more, and and I and I and I think we see a groundswell uh, going on here. The the Fairbanks News Miner editorial page uh, ran an editorial under the headline "Concerning Questions About Permanent Fund Leadership: Recent Events at the Alaska Permanent Fund Are a Cause for Concern." Internal emails leaked to the media outlets show the motives of one of the trustees have been called into question by top managers of the fund. We feel that the issue requires more scrutiny. Than it's thus far received, um, and goes on essentially to call for an investigation of the permanent fund board and what's going on there. And then the Ketchikan Daily News, which I follow to to sort of get the the um, the, the feel of what's going on in in the non Juno Southeast, uh, had a has an editorial on June fifth 
that's headlined Alaska Permanent Fund Needs Independent Inquiry. In Alaska think dividend. This is the first couple of lines. Alaska's Alaskans think dividends when the permanent fund, Alaska Permanent Fund is mentioned, but we should also be thinking investigation and be monitoring that review and, and be monitoring that review is more than appropriate. So it's, um, I think we're beginning to see the groundswell throughout the state uh, of people who are concerned about the Alaska, about the permanent fund board and, and the chaos that, uh, that, it's, uh, that it's causing. And I, and I think that that's something that, that, that the legislature needs to pay attention to. The column, my column this, this coming Friday in the Alaska landmine is going to be under the headline, is the Alaska Permanent Fund Board costing Alaskans money? And over the weekend, I had a chance to really finalize some analyses I've been doing. Um, and the, and the, and the sub headline is now going to read, uh, the answer seems to be yes. Um, I've done a lot of, a lot of digging into the performance measures that the permanent fund board itself has outlined, uh, for, uh, for its performance to evaluate its performance. It uses three benchmark measures to look at its performance, uh, a passive index benchmark, which is essentially how's the stock market or how's, how's a mix uh, of, of investments doing overall, if we just, you know, plugged it into a computer and let it go, what would it say? Um, performance benchmark, people who are trying to actively manage their, uh, uh, their portfolio, how's the permanent fund board, has the permanent fund measuring up to that. And then, the, and then something called the total fund return objective, which is very interesting. And frankly, I think I'm going to spend more time on that in future columns and future discussions here. Uh, but that the total fund return objective is how they're doing against the measure of inflation plus five percent. You know, we've set up the POMV draw at at five percent of the uh, of the permanent fund value, and in order for that not to be eating away at the permanent fund at the at the at the core at the earnings reserve and the corpus, the total the total permanent fund, in order for that not to be eating away. The, the permanent fund has to be returning at least 5% over inflation. And, and that's a really interesting measure uh, that I think uh, that the permanent fund board has set up. The, the, oh, the permanent fund board has charts or has reports that show how it's been performing against these measures over five years, over three years, and over one year. And it emphasizes that you can't, you really shouldn't look at these things in one year bites. You should look at it over time. And so they've got the three year and the five year measures. And if you look at it over the five years and the three years, it's doing okay. It's, it's generally underwater, interestingly enough. And this is what I'm going to dig into in future columns. But interestingly enough, it's generally underwater against the performance be benchmark, the, 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 5% plus or 5% on top of inflation. And that, I think, I think we're going to find out that's what's really going on with the earnings reserve. And that's what's really going on uh, with, uh, with the concerns about draining down the, down the earnings reserve. But, but generally they've been underwater ish on the three, uh, on that particular objective on the, on the performance measure on the five and three years, but they've been above water. They've been, they've been, they perform better. Then the other two performance measures, the, the the passive index and the performance index, they perform better than that on the five and three year uh, measures. On the one year measure, though, which is where you can see what's going on currently, what what, what the what what the developments have been currently, on the one year measure, they've gone underwater on all three. They're underwater. They're they're not performing as well against the performance measure against what other active investors are doing. They've gone underwater on the passive measure, which is something they've been above water on throughout. They've gone underwater on the passive measure uh, and they're, and they're, they're, they've gone underwater on the, on the CPI plus the, the inflation plus five. And what that's, what that's indicating to me is, is, is we're okay on the five year because of the early years in that five year. We're still okay on the three year because again of the early years in those three years, but when you focus in on that one year number, which is really when we, the period during which we're having this, this, this permanent fund board chaos, when you focus in on that one year number, we're going underwater. 
and I think I think what that's telling me is is we're going off track here with the with the the permanent fund board, which you know says they're the ones responsible for all this. Yes, we have a staff that implements it, but we're the ones for setting the policy, setting the objective, setting the setting the measures. Uh, what that really tells me is the permanent fund board who, who says they're responsible uh, is the is the one going off track here. So right. We, right. we've got I, we've got the ADN now calling for an investigation. We've got the Fairbanks News Miner. We've got the Catch Can Daily News. I, I haven't seen it in the Juno paper. I, I guess I sort of understand that it's a government town. Maybe they don't want to criticize right. the government too much. Right. Well, I, I, you know, and, and we've seen this where the permanent fund was, I mean, stratospheric at one point. Right. <clears throat> I mean, three, four years ago, it was up where, you know, 80, 82, 83, 84 billion dollars. It was high cotton season. And yet, uh, as the stock market has continued to grow back after the covid fiasco, the permanent fund has not uh, has not pulled even with them. And Donna in the chat room said my investment advisor significantly outperforms a permanent fund right now. So this is really a more recent problem. And it is indicative of what you're talking about, right? Yeah. It's not performing as it was. And this is prior to the departure of Angela Rodell and everything else. So is this really, a, a, a you know, a, a, all this, is this infighting inside, um, you know, removing the focus of what the permanent fund is supposed to be focused on? Yeah, I, 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 I think there is evidence to draw that conclusion. I'm not one who really says, oh, the absolute value, you know, 10 years ago was X and the absolute value now is Y, so it's doing well, or the absolute value yesterday was X and the absolute value today is Y, and so it's not doing well. I don't think that's the right measure. I, they set up the measures themselves with these benchmarks, and it's really how are you performing against your peers against the against the benchmarks are you are you at least keeping your yourself even with your peers are you outperforming your peers or are you going underwater compared to your peers they set up the benchmark sort of regardless of what the absolute value is i mean markets go up and down how are you doing against your against these benchmarks that you yourself you the permanent fund board itself has set up and i think the i think it's telling that against these benchmarks Forget the absolute values against these benchmarks that they themselves set up. They're going underwater. All three of them: the 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 performance, the passive, and the and CPI plus five. All three of them they're going underwater. And I think that's I think that's telling. I, I've not. I mean, looking back, I, I still got some more numbers to run. But looking back, I've not seen another period where all three have gone underwater. I've seen periods where one's gone underwater, two's gone underwater. But there's, they've always been outperforming at least one of the benchmarks. And now all three, they're underwater against all three. And I think I think that's indicative that that there should be concern. I mean, right. at, se separate and apart from this chaos, there should be concern. I mean, when you're right. underperforming your benchmarks. But the chaos is really, you know, adding a highlight to it is, is the chaos what's causing the uh, the, the performance. Right. Well, we'll uh, we'll have to see. We'll see if uh, this continues to be an issue. Jeannie asked, what is the ROI target? And I would say that it is the I mean, the good metric would be that 5% plus inflation is a good target to look at in the short and the long term, because <clears throat> that's going to be the draw from the fund. Right. I mean, they're going to draw basically 5% plus inflation is what they're going to draw every time. So if we want to keep the earning power, that's the ultimate. Uh, that's the ultimate target. Is am I wrong, Brad? No, I think that's right, Michael. I mean, if that that's that's what we're doing, and and generally that uh, standard is a little bit higher than the performance measure or the passive measure. So it's a it's sort of the the high target that they're shooting at. In the last five year, on a rolling five year look back, they've been underwater against that measure a little bit. Uh, the in two of the two of the last seven years in FY20 they were under a little bit in FY23 they were under a little bit they're under on the five year measure five year rolling out five five year rolling average they're under right now more than they have been before on the three year they've been they've been again a little bit under three year rolling average look back they uh, they 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 were under three of the last seven years. Uh, but again, they've been that's it's not been a big number. It's been minus 0.38 percent one year, minus 6.5 percent another year, minus 2.9 percent another year. When you look when you look at the at the at the la latest results, the latest performance results 
that the permanent fund board uh, publishes, they're under that performance measure 6.5% um, on a on a rolling uh, three year basis right now. So that's I mean, that's that that's that's telling right there. And then on the on the one year returns, uh, they've been under again. Uh, on a rolling one year basis, they've been under three of the last seven years, four of the last seven years. I mean, that's sort of, it sort of goes like that sort of goes like a roller coaster ride, but, but right now they're, they're, they're under it and they're under the other two performance measures. So um, it is, they're, they're, they're not by their own measures. They're not producing the returns that they need to return. And you can't, I mean, they're, they're going to quickly claim, Oh, the market's off or the market's doing this, or the market's doing that. But that's what the other two measures are telling you. They're telling they're telling you how you're doing compared to a passive return approach and compared to a performance return approach. And they're underwater on those also. So they're not keeping they're not keeping pace with the mark. They're not only not earning the uh, uh, the the return they need in order to keep the POMV positive. They're they're earning they're 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 working they're they're below where the market is telling you you ought to be as well. Well, and I think again, this is uh, this has become glaringly obvious. I mean, I can't remember any time in my past of covering Alaska politics where the permanent fund board has been so prevalent in uh, in the news, uh, been brought up more than once uh, every year or so over something. I mean, it's just it's <clears throat> they are in the headlines all the time, and that's not necessarily a good thing at this point. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> It's really, it's really hilarious. I mean, Adam Crumb's trying to use this as the launching point for his gubernatorial campaign, right? I mean, that's what the whole Wall Street Journal editorial that he did a couple of weeks ago was about. That's, you know, claiming that 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 he's at the center of all of these, of, of all of the state's investments. That's what that's all about. It's sort of humorous. I mean, he wants to be in the news. Uh, he wants to be using this as a as a as a springboard. But it's all going south on him, and it's all going south on Jason, and it's all going south on on Ellie. I mean, it's just they're they're in the news, but for all the wrong reasons, and it's getting worse. So I, yeah, I, I think again to go back to a discussion we had last week. I think the Financial Times article hit the nail on the head. We have a board composed of six financial laymen that are trying to run, you know, a, a critically important uh, investment fund for the state. And that's, that's where we've gone wrong. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, maybe a, again, a full revamp of the board and whether or not layman should be there for oversight. It's a, well, it'll be an interesting discussion to say the least. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets joins us. The weekly top three continues. We're on to number two. I was hoping you'd cover this story, Brad. When I when I read it the other day, I was like, "Oh man, never let a crisis go to waste." The ADN board is now hyperventilating over the South Central energy crisis. I mean, you know, it's the it's the the whole thing. Uh, they are they are deep into it here. Give me uh, give me your take on what the ADN board, the Binkley Family Blog, has decided to say about. Uh, uh, about the uh, the Cook Inlet gas issue. Well, in a weekend in a weekend op-ed, the ADM board ran an op editorial that says alarm bells sounding for South Central Alaska's energy future. Um, there's one thing to keep in mind as you read this, and that is that John Sims, who's the president of NSTAR, is the brother-in-law of the Binkleys. He's married to Kai Binkley Sims. Um, uh, and is the brother-in-law of the Binkleys. And, and then when you know that and you read a, uh, 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 an article that appeared on the Alaska News Source, the KTO, KTUU uh, website a few weeks ago or a, few, uh, a couple of weeks ago that says, NSTAR president encourages special session to, it, to address natural gas shortfall. And then you look, at, you, look at the AD, you look at that article and you look at the ADN headline, and there's amazing similarities uh, between the two. So I think we see John's relationship to the Binkley family, participation in the Binkley family sort of bleeding through here into the editorial page. Here, here's, here's the thing that really sort of, the reason I say they're hyperventilating. It's, it's all, the whole thing is written as 
it's a crisis. We've got to address the crisis. We can't have imported LNG coming into the state. Um, uh, costs too much, uh, and we've and we and we've got to stop it. And if it takes subsidies to do it, then then we need to have subsidies, and we need to have a special. Just goes on and on and on. Then we need to have a special session to enact the subsidies to 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 you know stop this this horrific result. What they don't talk anything about, what they don't mention at all, are the facts. <laughs> Interestingly enough. There was a report. We've talked about it on the show a lot of times. I've written about it in the in the in the landmine column a lot of times. There was a report that was done by the utilities themselves with with reputable, strong consultants that says, "Look, we're headed for a problem in the Cook Inlet, a, a cost rise in the Cook Inlet, regardless." Yes, LNG is more expensive than where we are now. But but the, the price it's going to take to incentivize additional cook in supplies is even higher than that. And, and, and so we're going to have rising prices regardless. The best of the bad situation that we're facing is LNG imports. And the best of, of that, of the LNG imports, is to use the existing uh, Kenai, Kenai LNG facility that's owned by Marathon down, existing LNG facility down in the Cook Inlet. It was built for LNG exports, but it's but but Marathon's gotten the necessary permits to turn it into an import facility. It's already got a pier. It's already got uh, uh, some some of the storage facilities that you would need with an LNG import facility. So the so the yes, we are facing. I mean, what the what the consultant report said. Yes, we are facing a crisis, and yes, we are facing higher prices, regardless. And and the best of that bad situation. Is is LNG imports, and the best of that of that bad resolution is is using the Key and I LNG facility. What if, so what if, so the so the ADN in the face of those facts, the ADN goes off on oh we can't have LNG it's going to you know increase costs. Well yes it's going to increase costs, but what you're not saying is relying on existing Cook Inlet supplies and paying those paying for those would be even higher costs. We we have run on cheap gas out of the Cook Inlet for years, decades, generations. It's gone. It's going to cost more to get gas in. What's the best of the bad situation? What the analyst report said, what the what the utilities report said was was LNG imports. I and, and then we've got and then we've got LNG John or LNG. We, then we've got NSTAR, John Sims out there saying, well, if we're going to have LNG, we're going to have to build this $50 million pipeline down to down to Port McKenzie, and we're going to have to build a new LNG facility down to Port McKenzie. This is going to cost huge amounts. Wait a second. We've got an existing LNG facility <laughs> that sits right next to oh, I know. An, a, an NSTAR pipeline that's going by it on the key. What, why are we talking about building you know, $50 million worth of pipelines and a new LNG? What is, what is going on here? And I think I think it's a scare tactic. I think Sims is engaged in a scare tactic. And I think now the the Binkley family blog, Sims's family blog <laughs> by marriage, Sims's family blog is is picking up on that scare tactic to try to scare the legislature without disclosing these facts, try to scare the legislature into into subsidizing Cook Inlet supplies to keep them below to keep them below um uh, to, to, to bring them on board and, and to and to and to bring them bring them into the cooking into the South Central energy mix. And and why are they doing that? Because th there's a couple of reasons that they may be doing that. One, if prices rise, the demand for N stars, the N demand for N star gas is going to go down. It's going to incentivize weatherization. It's going to incentivize going out and building additional renewable supplies. And so I think N star in part is concerned about um, that that they're going to have to they're going to lose demand if the if the prices go up. So subsidies would help avoid those prices going up. The other thing is, NSTAR's facing an obligate face, facing a serious obligation to have adequate supplies to meet demand. That will take money. I mean, I think they're I think they're way overestimating it with with this Port McKenzie deal. But it will take money in any event, even if you just hook up to the Kenai, even if the Kenai plant reverses and you hook up to the Kenai plant uh, and you hook up to the Kenai plant to bring in imports that way. That will take investment. That will take money. 
and I think I think Sims and and his parent corporation are trying to avoid that the obligation they have to make investment and to to you know bring in those the best of the bad, bring in the LNG supplies. And so, what's the best way to do that? Scare everybody, ignore the facts, get the legislature to enact subsidies. So, a I don't lose demand because I have subsidized supply costs, and b I don't have to make investments because we've subsidized additional exploration out in right. the out in the Cook Inlet, and I don't have to I don't have to come up with the money to make these additional investments that I'm obligated to do under my certificate. And so, I there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of as I said hyperventilation that's going on both in what Sims has, has explained and now it's carrying over to the Bankley family blog to, to create this scare tactic to, to, to get the legislature to subsidize these solutions. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I found it interesting that the, uh, uh, that the, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the paragraphs in this article and my eyes just kind of rolled back and I in my head when I, when I heard it, when they were talking about the notion of importing gas to this to a state with tremendous proven re- in uh, proven reserves is a, is anathema to many Alaskans who can't fathom why it doesn't make more sense to develop gas within the state until of course you explain the economics to them and then it goes on to say this should be a scary prospect for Alaskans as imported gas will by, be by no means cheap although it would be cheaper than developing the gas in the state and then it says, in addition to the cost of purchasing and transporting, Alaska customers would be on the hook for the cost of construction, constructing or purchasing a mess of infrastructure, a gas terminal at Port McKenzie or elsewhere, the pipeline and everything. I mean, this is exactly it. They they fail to mention that there's stuff that's nearly turnkey, nearly turnkey. And they go on to, to um, you know, to continue this, I mean, really, this this lie or this misinformation that somehow imported gas will won't be cheap. Well, it'll be cheaper than paying for the gas you got right now. And they're I mean, and their the point, right? And their own report. I mean, what's really bizarre about this is they pay for this report, they tout this report, they present this report to the regulatory commission of Alaska. It's a big deal. They present the report to the legislature. Okay, got it. You guys have certified this report. This is the report. These are the facts we need to go on. And now all of a sudden we're just ignoring it. Now all of a sudden, oh yeah, well I know I know what the facts are, but but let's let's not mess with those. Let's just run a scare tactic to see if we can jolt the legislature into into bailing us out of of these things that we need to do, yeah. and, and 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 we'll hide the fact it's more expensive by subsidies. Now, Michael, who's going to pay for the subsidies? That another <laughs> thing the ADN article doesn't address. The ADN I think article it would be you and me, Brad. I think we're going to pay for the subsidies. Middle and lower income Alaska families through additional PFD cuts. That's who's going to pay for the subsidies because yeah. we aren't get, we're going to get the revenue. So middle and lower income Alaska families are going to pay 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 for these subsidies. Who's not going to pay right for these additional well, costs? It, look, Chris makes an interesting point in the chat room. He says, "Why does the paper need to scare the legislature?" Uh, legislature. Sarah Vance was on the show just the other day telling us to pass a cheaper imported LNG. Uh, well, to, to pass an in, in-state to a subsidy because she thought it was better to use a more expensive Alaska gas. I think the legislature, I don't think the legislature is the target of propaganda. Special interests need to be convinced uh, the, and need to convince the people paying more that it's in their best interest. And he's not wrong. Sarah was on here and she said, well, no, we need to, she was talking about how we may need to to do this royalty thing because that makes sense because we need to use Alaskan gas. We're emotionally tied to the fact that uh, you know Alaska is just flush with gas, but we're emotionally divorced or intellectually divorced from the fact that it's mostly stranded, and we can't get to it, and the economics don't work out. Um, you know, my comment was, well, wait, if it's cheaper in the interim, in the short term, in the five year period, in the ten year period, to import the gas and then wait for other things to come up there. Oh, but she said, uh, this is Sarah, uh, was she and I agree on about 99% of the things, but then she said, well, they could just cut us off at any time. And I'm like, who could, co- who's the they? Who's the- <laughs> They're capitalists. They want to sell their gas like anybody else. Why would they cut us off from natural gas at any time? Um, you know, again, it sounds like the scare tactics are winning. And the largest LNG producer in the world is the United States. <laughs> who's cutting who's cutting who off here? 
the largest LNG producer in the world, in the world, is the United States through the Gulf Coast. I, there, nobody's cutting anybody off here. I mean, it, it, it's a function of price, but nobody's cutting anybody off here. I, I it, it is. I mean, Sarah Vance wants us to subsidize wants us to subsidize gas. Fine, Sarah. Who's paying for it? You say you're for a full PFD. You say we should reduce we should reduce costs and subsidies are costs. Tax credits are costs. You say that we should do those things. And yet when when push comes to shove, now you're saying, oh, we ought to subsidize without telling us, you know, that that if we're going to subsidize, we got to answer the question, who pays? And it's just, you know, Alaska is a high cost state and and we're beginning to see some of the reasons behind why Alaska is a high cost state in this debate. It's sort of, well, we ought to do this regardless, even though it's going to cost us more. We ought to do this regardless. Who's it going to cost more? Oh, it's going to cost middle and lower income Alaska families. Who are we having problems retaining in this state? Working middle and lower income Alaska Alaska families. They're the ones where the where the demographics are in decline. So you want to increase the tax on the on the on the portion of the population that we've already got a problem with. It's just it, it is it is it, it, it's way over the top and and the failure of the ADN editorial to be honest. And to talk about the numbers that are out there and talk about the options that are out there. There's not there's not one mention of the Kenai LNG, existing Kenai LNG facility right. in the in the in the entire op-ed. The right. failure of the ADN to be honest about these issues, well, it just tracks whatever John Sims said in the right. in the KTUU article. Well, and going hand in glove with this is this discussion about this new report, right? There was initial report on gas uh, and uh, uh, on gas in the Cook Inlet. Uh, and it was, you know, kind of doom and gloom and said, this is bad. And then, but we're working on a more detailed report on what it is. And yet we still haven't seen it. Now, Donna says something that I think is still, I mean, is still uh, uh, true. She says, Alaska importing gas would be like Columbia importing coffee. It's a failure. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. But again, from an economic standpoint, doesn't it make sense in the long or in the short term, even if you're looking at this? Because the importing of gas is the is the result of long-term failures, right? Of long-term planning. It's the result of years of of not doing the right thing and we're now reaping the benefit. It's not like the coffee plantation sitting right there and we're going to where we could roast our own coffee and we're going to import coffee. I mean, the the coffee plant is a thousand miles away on a North Slope in an Arctic grade and no way to ship the coffee to us. That's the problem. We're reaping the we're reaping the reward, quote unquote, of our bad decision making over the last 20 years in this result. Am I, am I wrong, Brad? No, you're absolutely right, Michael. I mean, we could have we could have watermelons, or we could have you know sweet corn. We could have you know uh, uh, field corn. We could have all sorts of things in this state, but it would take a hell of a lot of money to do it. We'd have to build these huge greenhouses and all sorts of stuff. We could we could be self sufficient in all of this stuff, but the economics don't support it. The economics say it's, it's cheaper to import that particular product uh, in order to in order to sustain. Uh, uh, the the society that we've got going in Alaska. Well, we've hit that point. Now, look, if 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 John Sims wants to pay, if John Sims wants to use NSTAR to subsidize producers in the Cook Inlet, and he can get that by the by the Regulatory Commission of Alaska by paying more, which is what the report tells us, paying more to to to, to you know bring to keep Alaska gas going. It's all about incentives. There is there is gas there. Just pay more. To get it, if you want to pay more than it would cost to bring in LNG, and you get that by the RCA, do it. But don't, don't go to the legislature and cry about it and create all of this chaos and cry about it and say, "Oh, I need a subsidy. I need a subsidy in order to to do this. I can't do this on my own. Oh no, it'd be too expensive." Don't, I don't cry about it. Just go do it. If you want to pay John Hendricks more, if you want to pay jo what John Hendricks wants in order to produce gas out of his field, go do it. Don't right. ask the legislature. That's what they do in Louisiana. That's what they do in Oklahoma. That's what they do in Texas. 
They don't run off to the legislature whenever energy costs get high. They pay for it. If they need the gas, they pay for it. Right. Well, John, John Sims, if you want the gas, go pay for it and, and ask the RCA to approve it. Oh, no, I can't do that. I'm, you know. This is about emotion, Brad. And I've said it a time, you know, I've been saying it all morning. I said it last week. This is about the emotional tie to, well, we're Alaska. We're loaded with gas. We want to use our own gas. Well, that's great, except for what's it take to get it to your market? Uh, and I'm going to modify what Chris has just said. Chris said on Twitch, imagine telling a low income family in Mountain View, hey, your energy costs are 20 percent higher, but at least you're not a loser. I would say, hey, your energy costs are 20 percent higher, but at least you're burning Alaska gas. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what they're going to say. They're 20 percent higher than what they would be. You know, overall, the costs are hidden, so you're not seeing them directly on your bill. But, hey, at least you're burning Alaska gas. Right. I mean, that's what people are saying. Uh, look, if it makes sense to import the gas and if you want, if you're so, you know, I would love to see Alaska gas go to market. I would love to see us burn our own gas. But what is the ultimate cost? That's the question. And not just the rate cost. What is the hidden cost as far as if the government subsidize it, subsidizes it and everything else? Break that out. What's that going to be? You can't just hide the cost and say, look, it's cheaper. Well, no, some, somewhere, some way, somebody had to pay for that. And we're paying for it through PFD cuts. I mean, so, yeah, so here's the, if we want premium Alaska gas, if that's our objective, Sarah, if that's our objective, whoever wants to, wants to argue for that, if you want premium Alaska gas, fine, pay for it. Pay for the difference yourself. Don't try to shove the costs off on middle and lower income, lower, middle and lower income Alaska families. And some people say, well, you know, Using the subsidies and getting cheaper gas will be will benefit lower income, middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah, well, it also benefits the top twenty percent. <laughs> and and so if we're going to do it, why shouldn't they pay for it? Why shouldn't they pay a proportionate share of the of the subsidies? Oh no, we can't do that. I, it's I mean, what we've got is a classic example of how Alaska has gotten into the situation it's gotten into which is we get these special interests, the producers in the Cook Inlet or, or the utilities who say, I don't want to pay for it. How can I get somebody else to pay for it? Oh, well, let's scare everybody. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. And, and say all these bad things are going to happen. It reminds me of the used car salesman who says, uh, don't look at the total price of the car. Just look at the monthly payment. Right. We've hidden everything else. I mean, the loan is 12 years at, you know, at 15 percent or something. But your monthly payment is super low. So check that out. That's what I'm reminded of when I look at this. The costs are much greater, but it doesn't matter because the costs are hidden. And that's what we're looking at now. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, joins us. Brad, we're just <laughs> talking about this Cook Inlet thing. But of course, the one thing that could answer a lot of the questions uh, is the reports and the analysis. We got an initial report um, which said some things. So walk us through that real quick. But also there's supposed to be this secondary report and nobody has seen it. And I wonder why. Well, we had a phase one analysis. I mean, the the, the numbers and the phase, the, those are the numbers that I keep going back to because they're the numbers we've got. They're the numbers the utilities gave us. They're the numbers that they represented are the accurate numbers. They're the numbers that, that, that are supposed to tell us what the solution is. And we've got the phase one report that says LNG, imported LNG is cheaper uh, in the, even in the intermediate term is cheaper uh, than, than the additional costs of going to get Cook Inlet gas. And, and we talked about, you know, they're trying to hide the additional costs of going to cook it to get Cook Inlet gas through the subsidies, through the subsidies they're pleading with the legislature to provide. But, but we've got this initial report that says LNG is cheaper than, than, than the additional cost of Cook Inlet gas. And, and that's, those are the numbers that, that are out there. They were presented to the, to the RCA nearly a year ago in June of 2023. But at the time that they were presented to the RCA, the utilities and the consultants that, that the utilities hired to do the analysis told the RCA, look, we're refining these numbers. We're moving toward a decision point. We've got to think through you know, some additional implications. These numbers may change. We're gonna, we're gonna refine them and we're going to uh, we're gonna we're gonna come up with an additional analysis by the end of the year. Was the was the was the projected target date for the initial analysis? Then we'll come to the RCA with the solution, and then we'll ask for whatever 
uh, authorizations we need to, to move forward with this. We are now six, nearly six months. We're now nearly a year from the from the release of that report, and we're nearly six months from the end of the year when they said they were going to have the second report. I've got it on fairly good authority. The second report's done. Where is it? If 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 we want it, if we want to go screaming around, if we want to go hyperventilating about all of these, about all of the horribles that are about to happen to us, if we want to hyperventilate about the higher cost of LNG, um, then okay, release the second. And, and if the higher cost of LNG is higher, is now higher than than what we think unsubsidized Cook Inlet uh, production would be, you know, fine, release the report. If those are the numbers. And we can dig into the numbers and analyze those numbers, and those are now the correct numbers. Then fine, let's 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 rethink where we're headed here. Um, if Cook Inlet's going to be unsubsidized, Cook Inlet's going to be cheaper than than imported LNG. Let's go. Let's let's you know go down that road for a while and let's dig into it. But that's not what that's not, that they haven't come up with numbers that show that. The only numbers numbers that are out there are the are the previous. Uh, are the the previous report. So it makes you think the second report's done, most like most likely done, let's say most likely done. The second report's most likely done. You haven't released it and and you're running around screaming, you know, hyperventilating about these about these parade of horribles and ignoring the first report. What does that make you think? <laughs> so who's who's responsible for this report, Brad? Who is who is the agency or the or the body responsible for this report? What's going on? So the utilities did the report. The utilities paid for it. The utilities own it. So they're the ones that have control uh, over the report. But the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, the regulatory agency that's set up by statute, has control of the utilities. They're the ones. The RCA are the ones who enforce. The utilities' obligation, who 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 monitor and enforce the utilities' obligations to have supplies to meet, uh, to meet adequate supplies to meet demand. So I, the RCA could say, "Look, you got the second report done. Produce it. You got the second report done. Have a presentation on it. Let's get these numbers out on the table so we don't have all these people hyperventilating based upon you know false numbers or based upon old numbers. If there are new numbers that are better, let's get it on the table. Let's discuss those." Let's stop this emotional hyperventilating that's going on. So the RCA could do that. The RCA has the authority over the utilities to, to force them to do it. it. What the RCA has done thus far is to have each of the utilities come up, the South Central utilities come up, well, and, and GVEA, since they're tied to the South Central grid, have, have the utilities come up and say, what, what is, what's your plan for in the event that we run short of supply? That's all they've had them talk about. They haven't talked about, okay, how do we avoid these shortfalls in supply? Uh, what, what are we doing going forward? How are you going to comply with your obligation to serve? How are you going to comply with your obligation to have adequate supplies uh, to serve? We haven't had a hearing on that. And, and it's time for the RCA to step in there. It, it, in one of the presentations by Chugach, I think it was, Chugach said, the question was asked of Chugach, when do you have to make up your mind about what the alternative supplies are going to be. And, Chug and the response from the Chugach representative was by the end of the second quarter. At, it was sort of hesitating, like, I'd like to say now, but it's like, you know, by the end of the second quarter. Well, we're what, 20, 19 days away from the end of the second quarter. And that's when they're supposed to have made the decision. There's a lot that needs to go on before you make the decision. There's a lot that, that needs to go on before you confirm the decision. And that is presentations, discussions, asking the RCA for approval if you need to make additional investments to, to implement it. We're 19 days away from the deadline that the utilities themselves set. They haven't even produced the report that that, that all yeah. this is supposed to be predicated on. We're Michael, we are we are factless. We've got people spinning out there, the ADN out and you know Sarah Vance factless about right. about about this situation but that's not stopping them so what's your implication here is the implication to you does this speak to you uh, and say essentially the report doesn't follow the narrative that we're trying to make here and so that's why we've kind of not produced it um because if it is done 
then you would think it would. And if it backed up their assertions, you think they'd be touting it from the rooftop. So is the implication to you that the report basically says that importing LNG is the base is the best option and, and that's why they're avoiding putting it out? Yep. Two things are telling me that. One is they're not releasing the report, which I, I suspect now is going to be a confirmation of the first report, which is LNG is cheaper than in the intermediate and long term than 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 Cook Inlet gas, continue reliance on, reliance on Cook Inlet gas, and a hell of a lot cheaper than bringing it down from the North Slope. One is that the second report confirms that. The fact they haven't released it confirms that. The second thing is they're still going for these subsidies. Right. And, 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 and why do you subsidize something if it's cheaper already? If you can, if you can pay what John Hendricks wants to, to produce from the, from the kitchen lights uh, uh, field, if you can pay that and it's cheaper than LNG, why aren't you doing that? But no, they're still going for subsidies. So those two things, the fact they haven't released the report and the fact that they haven't, uh, that they're still pushing for subsidies now, you know, through John Sims's article in the in the in the Alaska news source, and now through the you know Binkley family blog, you know, argument for for a uh, special session, they're they're continuing to push they're continuing to push for these subsidies. I I'm increasingly concerned about what the RCA isn't doing in this situation. The RCA has the obligation to ensure that the utilities meet the obligation to serve. The RCA is the agency charged with enforcing their obligation to serve. If I were on the RCA, and nobody will ever put me there now, but if I were on the RCA, I would be saying, get your get up here, get in front of the witness table and tell me what you're doing to have supplies so that we don't have to implement these curtailment plans. Tell me what you're doing to, to, to meet your obligation to serve. Show me that second report. Put the re second report on the record so we all can be talking about facts. That's what I'd be doing if I was on the RCA. But the RCA is not doing that. And I and I think you know we're sort of cluelessly wandering off into this into this into this this situation where all we've got is fear mongering and and you know hyperventilation that's uh, that's driving the driving the discussion. Uh, all right, Brad, well, we're getting ready to wrap up here. The solution to you is the RCA must step in. Is there anything else we can do? I, we can keep talking about it, Michael, because I, I think, you know, we got Sarah Vance, we got other legislators out there now saying, oh, we need these subsidies. I mean, we can continue talking about it because this is an economic decision that's going to affect all Alaskans in one way or another. Certainly is if we're going to subsidize them through PFD cuts. This is an economic decision that's going to affect all Alaskans. We need to continue talking about it until we get some facts, some more facts, some updated facts out there that we can use for the analysis. I mean, this whole thing, Brad, again, I, I keep coming back to it, but we are just so emotionally attached to, and you, you had the perfect example. We could grow sweet corn here. We could grow whatever. We used to grow a lot of this stuff right here in the state of Alaska. And now we import it. Why? Because in the short and the long term, it was cheaper to import than it would. Now it creates other problems. That is, you know, food security, you know, having it on hand, sustainability. There are other issues. But the long term is, is that if it's twice as much for food that it is already because we had to grow it in Alaska, that means that fewer people will live here because they can't afford it. This is exactly the same thing. Is it cheaper to bring it in in the short, medium, long term? Yes. Is it? Would it be better if we could burn Alaska gas? Absolutely. But does it make economic sense? And everybody is so tied to it emotionally, it's like they can't get off that. They can't get off that pedestal. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, I look. The, our discussions are about what makes economic sense. Our discussions are about what's in the state's best economic fiscal interest. I think that's I think that's even the lead in to, to the to the weekly top three. Um, or one of the buffers you have about the weekly top three. That's what we're discussing here. And what makes the most economic sense for Alaska, according to last year's phase one report, is importing LNG. That makes more economic sense than either paying more for cook inlet supplies or subsidizing cook inlet, cook inlet supplies. It makes more economic sense. If that's not true, if the phase two report shows that's not true, then fine. Show us the phase two report, get the numbers out there so we can go on and talk about something else. 
But until you show us numbers that, that, that where Cook Inlet makes more economic sense, costs Alaskans less than, L, than imported LNG supplies. And, 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 you know, maybe I'll stop talking about it as an imported LNG because, again, the United States is the world's, the world's biggest supplier of LNG. It's just moving, it's just moving U.S. LNG, moving U.S. gas up to Alaska, lower 48 gas up to Alaska uh, on ships. Right. Maybe, right. Know, maybe, maybe I ought to stop talk, using the word imported. That's, that's what we would largely be doing. U.S. gas to Alaska on ships. Uh, Fat Ray says, and I'm going to disagree with this completely, tax credits aren't costs. They're simply the state stealing less money from an individual or organization. The problem is if the state has a budget, let's just put a number, say it's a billion dollars. That's their budget. And they issue a hundred million dollar tax credit to some organization or combination of organizations to the state. They still have a billion dollar budget. And they've got to figure out, okay, we've given these tax credits, unless they're oil tax credits where they actually pay them like they did before, right, under Walker. I mean, they still have a hundred, they still have a billion dollar budget that they've got to, they've got to justify. They've still got people to pay. They've still got programs they started and everything else. So they have to find that money somewhere else. So it is a cost because just because they did the tax credit doesn't mean they're like oh well we'll live more within our means we knew that last year we had a billion dollars we know that this year we're going to have a billion dollars even though we issued the tax credits now we got to find some other place to take that money and that's from you fat ray and from me and from everybody else it is a cost in the long run it's a cost in the short run i mean it is it it is a cost that's what tax credits are that's why we that's why I've, you know been on this rant about julie colomb's uh, a child care tax credit. It's you're you're essentially subsidized. You're essentially saying, okay, Conoco, you don't have to pay as much money because Conoco is going to be a big user of it. Conoco, you don't have to pay as much money to the state, uh, in, in as long as you you know divert that money and and use it for child child care credits. Well, you're exactly right, Michael. The budget isn't going down. Somebody's going to have to make up that difference that Conoco is now diverting it off to child care credits, and it's going to be through PFD cuts. That's the marginal source of revenue in this state. So it's going to be middle and lower income Alaska families that are essentially paying for those, paying for the Conoco's childcare. It's, it's, ha, yeah, to, to try to, to try to convince yourself that, that, that tax credits or tax subsidies aren't, aren't an expense is, I mean, you're, you're, you're blinding yourself to the reality, the economic reality. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Taxes are a cost to me, he says. Taxes are a cost to, to cost to me and you. Yes, I agree. Taxes are a cost to me and you. But just because they issue a tax credit, that's them giving money to somebody else on your behalf. You're paying for that one way or the other. That's what's happening. Uh, Donna also says it's not emotional. It's a poor business plan. Can it be both? I mean, I'm just asking, Donna, can it be both? Because I agree with you. It's also a poor business plan. To me, it's emotional and it's a poor business plan. That's what's going on right there. Uh, I feel like that as uh, I feel like that is uh, is an important point there. Um, all right. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, the weekly top three. I just had something crash here that I had to restart. Final thoughts, Brad, as we get ready to wrap up here. Well, Michael, we need to, we need to get more facts on the table. I mean, all, the, all of these reactions about, oh, we need we need Alaska gas. Well, we need to know seriously what the cost of Alaska gas is before we make that judgment. And, and we need to get the facts on the table. The RCA should have the utilities come up, explain what their plans are, and put that second put the second report on the table so we can start looking at, at the numbers. All right. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks as always for coming on board and uh, and laying this out to us and uh, excited to see what's going to happen in the coming days here with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the political spectrum. You know who who you're going to be talking to creating a fiscal uh, caucus would be a fantastic thing. And I can't wait to uh, to see what you're able to bring from that. So thank you, Brad. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.